Well, hello, Christ community. Welcome back to Help Me Study the Bible. Uh, if you've stuck with us this long, you must want to learn how to study the Bible. So I hope that this uh, study has been helpful to you uh, thus far. I'd love to hear back from you. Uh, there on Facebook, you can leave a comment letting us know what's been most helpful to you or what would be helpful to you. What would be something that in the weeks to come uh, we could help explain in terms of Bible study or different genres? Uh, questions do you have? We want this to be as, as helpful for you in equipping you to study the Bible. So that being said, let's jump right in today. We are going to be looking at wisdom literature again, but we're going to be looking specifically at poetry. And to do that, we're going to look at the book of Psalms. Now, when we talk about the book of Psalms, we're talking about uh, a book of uh, poetical songs. These are poems that are written oftentimes as prayers to God, but they're also meant to be sung by the believing community. So again, We'll talk about context in just a second, but we're talking about uh, Israel. We're talking about the Israelites, the believing community, Yahweh's people, singing together. And there are all kinds of different psalms. Uh, there are psalms of thanksgiving, songs of praise, songs of lament. Uh, there are even, uh, there's a category called imprecatory psalms, which we might talk about that in weeks to come where a person is praying for God's justice to fall on their enemies. So the book of Psalms is a beautiful book. And I would highly recommend that if you don't read through the book of Psalms um, on any consistent basis that you begin doing so. Um, I often tell people in my own life it's been very helpful uh, in seasons when I've done a psalm a night before I go to bed just a way to kind of set your mind on things that are above, like Colossians 3 talks about. And Psalms is such a beautiful book because it's, it's real. It's raw. People are bearing their hearts to God. And I love that God, um, by the Holy Spirit, inspired the various authors of the book of Psalms to write in such a way that they both bore their heart to God, and yet God perfectly revealed his will, and he gave for you and me um, a lens by which we can see into uh, the human personality walking through different seasons of life, but also how we turn to God and we put our hope in him and our trust in him. So as we talked about last week, when we're looking at wisdom literature, we're talking about books like Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon which we might talk a little bit about that uh, in weeks to come as well. Now, when we are looking at wisdom literature, we're seeing a combination of literary tools that are used. So narrative, poetry, imagery, parallel statements, um, things that are meant to convey a picture to us. And so one of the best things to do when you're reading through Psalms is to, to almost imagine a scene unfolding or to imagine uh, a master painter uh, painting on a canvas and as, he, as you read the text you see each brush stroke and the painting is filled in as you go. Um, Psalms are meant to be felt. We're meant to understand uh, intellectually what they're saying but then they're supposed to affect us at uh, the soul level, at the heart level, they're to move our affections in some way, and the tone of the passage helps us understand what that is supposed to be. And then it should lead us ultimately, like any good Bible study should, it should lead us to action, or it should lead us to believe something new, to believe something new, or to act in some new way in accordance with his word. So, one of the other things that we want to stress that we talked about last week is that in the pursuit of wisdom, we're talking about a journey of knowing, whereby what we know intellectually um, is worked out practically. And our willingness to persevere in that journey shows the true condition of our heart. Uh, do we just want quick answers to life's problems? 
or do we want to know the Lord? Do we want to walk in relationship with him? And so wisdom literature is meant uh, to take uh, us on a journey to grow in wisdom, and that journey takes time, it takes practice, and a willingness to wrestle with some of life's biggest issues. So, before we get started with Psalm chapter 1, kind of the gateway psalm into the rest of the book, let's stop and pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we thank you once again that as a church family, uh, perhaps even as friends who are watching uh, who may not be members of this church, Lord, we ask that you would lead us into the truth. Your word is truth. And you've told us that your spirit will lead us into that truth as he speaks to us through your word. And so we ask, Father, that in your grace, uh, you would help us to understand, believe, and obey your word to the glory of your name. Help me as your servant uh, to faithfully and clearly communicate your word. And I pray that as a result, our people would be equipped uh, for every good work as they walk according to your word. And if there's anyone who's listening or watching this uh, who doesn't know you, I pray that you would lead them to repent of their sins, to trust in Christ alone as their Lord and Savior, and to follow you according to your word. Bless this time now, and we ask these things by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Psalm chapter 1. Hopefully you've got your physical copy of the Bible there. A uh, piece of paper or a notebook and a pen to be able to jot down notes. Um, there on the website, you should have a copy of the notes uh, that have the coma questions to walk you through wisdom, poetry, and we'll get started. So Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. This is uh, a beautiful example of Hebrew poetry with some of those uh, literary tools that we talked about in the beginning. So, using our coma method, what do we want to do? We want to start by using or talking about the context. That's our first word. So when we're talking about context, we're asking, where are we? We want to know where we are so we know where we need to go. Well, what do you think? You're right. You answered, well, we're in the Old Testament. And because we're in the Old Testament, we're anticipating the coming of Christ. Uh, specifically, we're in the wisdom section of Scripture. And that's important, again, for how we read the passages and how we interpret them. Uh, because we're not in a historical narrative uh, or in uh, necessarily a prophetic text or some other kind of genre, uh, we need to know that we're reading poetry. And poetry is meant to be read as something beautiful, thought-provoking. It's meant to stir us emotionally. It's painting images that tell us truth. So on the one hand... We want to be careful to make good observations of the imagery uh, that is being conveyed. And on the other hand, we'll talk more about this with parables when we get to the Gospels. We don't want to press images too far. Uh, we don't want to try to dissect every uh, little bit of that imagery. Otherwise, we sort of uh, lose the forest for the trees. So we want to stay focused on what the big picture is and what the author is trying to communicate to us. Now, we're not told exactly who the author uh, of this passage is, but we come to Psalm chapter 3, and we see that it is a psalm of David. And David authors many of the psalms in the, in the book. 
So it's someone like David, someone perhaps close to David in the same season as David, but someone who's a part of the believing community. And in some ways, it's sort of beautiful that there isn't a specific author attributed necessarily um, because we get to focus on the truth rather than the person behind that. And ultimately, we know the Holy Spirit is the one who inspires this. This is the first psalm in a collection of psalms that number about 150. Uh, so this is, again, the gateway psalm. It, in some ways, sets the tone for how we read the rest of the book. And we want to keep that in mind as we're reading this. So that tells us a little bit about the context. And again, when you're asking these sorts of questions, when you come to poetry, uh, or wisdom literature, you're asking, are there any clues about the circumstances in which the passage was written? We don't necessarily see that. Uh, it's more of a general uh, psalm. What has happened so far? Well, this is the first psalm. So uh, in terms of the book, nothing has happened up to this point. So again, it's sort of a fresh canvas to paint on here. By the way, this side note, it's just a, a pet peeve of mine. When you're talking about an individual chapter here in the book, you're talking about a psalm. But when you're talking about the book as a whole, you're talking about the book of psalms, so plural. So Psalm 1 is what we're looking at. Sorry, just needed to get that off my chest. So now let's ask some observation questions. We're moving on in coma here. We want to make some observations of the text. And again, just uh, for uh, your information, and you see it there on your notes, uh, when we're asking observation questions of, of uh, text in wisdom literature, we're asking questions like, are there repetitions or multiple instances of similar ideas? Do these repetitions make a particular point or point to the structure of the passage? What images or metaphors does the author use? What do they indicate about God or the other people in the text? What might they indicate about modern readers? What is the tone of the passage? Uh, what emotions is the author arousing? What is the main point or points? And what surprises are there? Uh, so again, these are important questions as we read through Psalm chapter 1 and any passage in wisdom, literature, and scripture. So let's get going and let's see what we can observe uh, from our text. Verse 1, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Now, from the get-go, we want to know <laughs> what the word happy means. Happy, maybe your translation says blessed. I know the ESV says something like, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So, blessed or happy. Now, if we read the context, we're going to learn something about what it means to be happy. And I would, uh, I, I would say that that's a very different concept than what you and I know to be happy in the culture and in the day and time in which we live. So happy. Uh, what does it mean to be happy? Who is the happy person? Well, let's keep reading. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers? Isn't that interesting, the progression there from walking to standing to sitting? Uh, again, that's, that's not a, uh, a coincidence that we're seeing this. The author is showing us movement uh, as he writes the psalm. Happy is the one who does not walk in what? The advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. So again, uh, three ideas that... Uh, seem to point to the same thing, the same concept, but in slightly different ways. And again, notice how happy is the person who, uh, the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, 
or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the uh, company of mockers. So this thrice repeated concept is communicating something that the author wants us to see. Uh, There is this sense of uh, the person who is happy avoids moving with, sitting with, taking company with the person who is wicked, who is sinful, who is a mocker, who, uh, when you think of mocking, uh, the idea is of almost making fun of what someone else is saying. They're uh, boasting about what they think over and against what someone else thinks, or they're making fun of them or making light of what they're saying. So the happy person is the person who avoids walking with these sorts of people, standing with these people, sitting with these people. They don't take the advice of these people. They, uh, they don't move in the same logical ways of thinking. They don't take up the company of these people. They're not in close relationships. So, uh, it's important that we see these parallels or these stepping stones in the text. It's almost developing a rhythm uh, for our reading. Verse 2, instead, instead, there's a comparison and contrasting taking place here. So, not this, but this. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. There's so much here to pull out. Let's, let's do our best to see what we can discover here. His delight, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. That's a beautiful word, isn't it? His delight is in the Lord's instruction. That's not just um, it makes him sort of happy or it's somewhat pleasing or um, it, it's something that comes to mind every so often and, and gives him good feelings. No, he delights in it. Like a person delights in a beautiful sunset over the ocean or the way that a groom looks at his bride walking down the aisle or the way you enjoy um, a home-cooked meal that you've been looking to, uh, looking forward to uh, all year uh, leading up to Thanksgiving or Christmas. The company of people around the table, that sense of warmness, that sense of brightness, that sense of joy, that's what delight is. It's a, Those kinds of words almost have a texture to them. You can see them, you can hear them, you can smell them, you can, you can touch them. So his delight is in the Lord's instruction. The Lord's instruction. Now, again, that, that's important for a few reasons. It tells us whose instruction he delights in. It also tells us that this is, like we talked about um, in weeks past, this is Yahweh's instruction, the God of Israel. I am who I am, like he told Moses at the burning bush back in Genesis. This is Israel's covenant God. The Lord is one. He's unique. He's distinct. Uh, He is unified within himself, even though he exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's the Lord's instruction, not just anyone's instruction, but the Lord's instruction. And again, that word instruction is a synonym for the law or for the ordinances, the statutes, or what we might more commonly call the scriptures or God's word. So again, those are little things that we might skip over, but they add context, they add depth to the passage as we read it. So instead of walking with these people, sitting with these people, standing with these people, instead he delights, his hope, his joy, his satisfaction is in Yahweh's instructions. And he meditates. What an important word. He meditates on it day and night. Now, what does it mean to meditate on something? Well, it's probably not the idea that we have in mind where you cross your legs and you stick your hands up in the air and you start humming or something like that. 
to meditate on something is to let it roll around in your head. It's to chew on it, we might say, uh, or it's at the front of our mind, or it's on hand. It's something that is with us that uh, we're, we're sort of, you might say, daydreaming about when we're pumping gas or when we're standing in the checkout line at the grocery store uh, or when we're getting coffee at work or when we're folding clothes at the house or maybe even when we're going to bed um, after the day or maybe we're on a, a, a phone call with someone talking about a difficult situation. To meditate on scripture in its broadest sense is that it's on our minds and we recall it and we turn it over. Uh, again, sort of like you taking a, a diamond and holding it up to the light and turning it to see how the light refracts through it in different ways. That's what we're doing with God's word is throughout the day it comes to mind and we're thinking on it and we're turning it and we're considering it. More specifically, meditation means we're taking God's word. We're not just trying to empty our minds, but instead we're trying to think on this word. So meditation might look like this. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. Or instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. Or instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. Or instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. We're emphasizing different parts and we're chewing on it, thinking about what it means. And so, given verses 1 and 2 here, we see that the truly happy person is someone who avoids the way of the wicked, uh, standing with sinners, sitting with scoffers, but instead he delights in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. And that phrase, day and night, is really important too. Now again, this is where we want to think through the expressions that are being used by the author. Day and night. What is he saying there? What he's probably not saying is that literally, over 24 hours, you're constantly meditating on the Bible. Instead, it's a broader idea that says, uh, oftentimes, or all throughout the day and night, uh, a general statement to say that God's word is often on your mind. You're considering it on a consistent basis throughout the day. And that, again, is what's so valuable about meditation and or memorizing scripture is it allows you to take God's word with you even if you can't have a physical copy in your hands. And that's in fact one of the ways that the Holy Spirit leads us into the truth by helping us to recall the things that we've hidden in our hearts, the things that we've been chewing and meditating on. He brings it to mind in that moment when we need to be considering it. Um, and so you may be at work and you're being asked to do something that you know is immoral or unethical. And as you're sitting there contemplating what you're going to do because perhaps your job is on the line, you think to yourself, you know, I just read this morning in Psalm 1, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. And right there, the Holy Spirit has helped you to remember his truth so that you can make the right decision in that situation. And we could go on and on with illustrations here. So those are the first two verses. Verse three, he's like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now we've switched here into a new tactic or a new literary device and that is imagery in which the author here is uh, painting a picture for us. So one of the things I like to do sometimes when I'm reading scripture, and I know I've mentioned this before, is that I will literally close my eyes and try to imagine this scene here. So if you close your eyes and you think about verse three, he's like a tree planted beside flowing streams. A tree. 
He's a tree, like a tree. He's comparing the happy person who delights in the Lord's instruction, meditates on it day and night, with a tree planted, planted beside flowing streams. Flowing streams. So in your mind's eye, you're thinking about this healthy looking tree that is planted beside not just a stream but a flowing stream so you might even be able to hear the stream in your uh, in your mind um, perhaps in the background it's it's a more of a desert wasteland but right here by the stream the tree is planted and is doing well and we see that because He's like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit, bears its fruit in its season. So in other words, it produces what it is created to produce when it's supposed to produce it. That's the idea there. And we don't want to press it really far, but the idea is the tree is healthy because it's by the water, so it does what it ought to do. And its leaf, its leaf, does not wither. Its leaf does not wither. So even when it's hot, uh, even when it's sunny all the time, even when it's dry all around, because that tree is planted by this flowing stream, its fruit grows and its leaves stay green. It's thriving. It's healthy. So again, what these images do is it, it gives us almost texture to the psalm. It helps us to see it in our mind's eye so that when we think about, well, what does a wise person or what does a happy person look like, that's the picture that comes to our mind. And he ends it by saying, whatever he does prospers. Now, this is a really good example of something that we're going to see often uh, in wisdom literature. And that is general truths. Okay? When we're reading wisdom literature, we're reading what is generally true of a person's life who walks in godly wisdom and what is generally true of a person's life who walks in worldly wisdom, the consequences. Now, we don't want to press it further than that because the... Wisdom literature is not to be uh, a detailed list of all the exceptions, perhaps, to that rule. Because we know people who have loved the Lord and hidden his word in their heart, and they're like a tree planted beside flowing streams, and yet they suffer greatly in life. So if we press these truths too far, we'll find ourselves uh, disillusioned or distorting what God's word is actually meant to say. Uh, not only that, but we will misconstrue who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the wisest person to have ever lived, and yet he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Uh, he bore the wrath of God. So again, we're talking about general truth. So whenever it says, whatever he does prospers, well, that's a general truth of a person who walks in godly wisdom. It's meant to be a blessing to our life. It's meant to make you prosper in your relationships, in your work, uh, in your parenting, in your marriage. And I think we can say with honesty that the person who does those things, generally speaking, enjoys uh, w biblical prosperity in those relationships and those aspects. So we want to hold fast to what God's Word is saying here, while at the same time not pressing it too far. So just to reiterate... The author is using a simile where he's comparing two unlike things to, uh, to paint a picture for us. He's using um, the tree imagery to show what a happy or blessed person is like. It bears its fruit, its leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. And in, if you read this, and again, you have uh, made the decision to read through scripture on a regular basis, you're going to begin asking yourself as you're making these observations, where else do we hear about something bearing fruit? Um, is that significant in other passages? Perhaps even in the New Testament, does G Jesus talk about bearing fruit? 
Um, or does the Apostle Paul talk about a person's life, their words and their deeds being like fruit that grows from a tree? Those are things that connections or things that you want to write down and, and say, okay, I want to go and search that uh, here shortly so that I can put it in the context of Scripture as a whole and have a more rounded understanding of what the author is getting at here. The wicked, on the other hand, are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Okay, so here we have, in contrast to the happy person, we have the wicked person. The wicked person. And again, that's something we want to ask, what does it mean to be wicked? Where else is that idea developed throughout Scripture? Now, just based on reading Psalm 1, we can see already that it seems more positive to be the happy or blessed person or the wise person than it is to be the wicked person. It seems as if they're being painted in a negative light. So the wicked are not like this. What's this? Well, it's pointing back to the picture of the tree that is uh, bearing fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Instead, here's the contrast coming up again. Instead, they, the wicked, are like chaff. Chaff that the wind blows away. It's so a really powerful image that's being used here. Now, in reading scripture, you come to see this idea again. In fact, um, I'm running ahead of myself here, but even Jesus is going to talk about uh, the wheat uh, and the tares, or wheat and the chaff. Um, and so what happens, again, this is something as you're reading through scripture that you're, you're going to see this is an agrarian society, so farming is the way of life. Uh, you have people harvesting the wheat, and they're separating the wheat from the chaff. Uh, sort of the flaky stuff that doesn't have any nutrition to it, that as they gather it in sort of a, a shallow bowl, or in sort of a screen-like device, they're going to toss the wheat up in the air, and it's going to come back down on, uh, on the device, while the chaff that's lighter, that doesn't have the nutrition, is blown away. That's the imagery that's being shown or that's being described for what the wicked person is like. See the comparison there now, the picture that's being painted, how powerful that is? The happy person who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night is like this tree that grows, bears fruit, its leaf doesn't wither, whereas the wicked are like the useless chaff that gets blown away to be no more, while the wheat remains and it has a lasting effect. So to be a wicked person is to be the opposite of the healthy of the healthy tree, and in fact, it's to be like useless chaff that is blown away when it's tossed up in the air. Which again, we want to ask ourselves, is this a concept that we see throughout Scripture? Can we think of other times in which um, the wicked person or the person who doesn't trust the Lord is taken away or is sent off? or is useless and therefore is to be burned. These are all ideas that we see coming up both through the Old Testament and the New Testament that help round out our understanding of what the author is saying here in Psalm chapter 1. Verse 5, therefore, therefore. Now, I'm sure you've heard it. Now, Pastor Ronnie usually doesn't say cheesy things like this, but... I do. Um, when you see the word therefore, you ask the question, what's it? That's right, therefore. Uh, as cheesy as that might sound, it's actually an important question. Especially when you get to, say, the epistles in the New Testament. When you see the word therefore, that's helping you understand there was a prior argument or discussion or something that took place 
that is is needs to be understood in order to understand the passage you're looking at right now. So your present discussion, your present reading will be informed, filled in, made sense of by looking at what came before. So all of that being said, verses 1 through 4 that we've looked at and made these observations precedes what he says here. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment. Will not stand up in the judgment. Not just a judgment, though. The judgment. So... In light of what he said, in light of the fact that the wicked are like chaff that the wind blows away, they're not like uh, the, the happy person, the blessed person, the wise person who's like a tree bearing fruit, leaf doesn't wither, whatever it does it prospers. Because it's useless, good for nothing, that wicked person will not stand up in the judgment. It's interesting that he's already used this sort of language um, to begin the psalm. Uh, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. So he's using similar language. But to stand up in the judgment, think about what that idea might contain. Uh, like a person standing on trial, the person who stands up in the judgment is someone who is uh, counted not guilty. So a person who doesn't stand up in the judgment is someone who is condemned as guilty. They fall under the judgment rather than standing up over it. So the wicked will not stand up in the judgment. What judgment is he talking about? Well, he goes on to say he will not stand up in the judgment nor sinners, sinners in the assembly of the righteous. So sinners and wicked are synonymous here. To be wicked is to be a sinner. Oh, now where our understanding is growing here. To be a wicked person is to be a sinner. And to be a sinner, and we just have to go back in time here, back to Genesis, to see when sin enters the world, and to sin is to disobey the commands of God, to do what is contrary to the law of God. So a person, we all sin, we know that. We're born sinners. Uh, scripture is very clear about that. Go read Romans 5 if you want clarity on it. Because we're born into sin, we will sin. But people who have been saved by grace are not defined as sinners. They may sin because they're still human, but they have a fundamentally new identity so that they're not described as sinners or liars or adulterers or homosexuals or uh, murderers. They're defined as being in Christ. And that's really important for our understanding of Psalm, Psalm chapter 1. To be wicked is to be a sinner, which means you're out of a right relationship with God. And so these sinners will not stand in the assembly of of the righteous, assembly of the righteous. And again, notice the assembly of the righteous. Not just any assembly, but the assembly. So we've got these two contrasting ideas here. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment. They're parallel statements, excuse me, parallel statements, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. So apparently, a judgment, the judgment, is coming in which Yahweh, the Lord, is going to judge between the happy person and the wicked person. And the wicked person, according to verse 5, will not stand up in the judgment. Instead, they will suffer judgment. And as a result, they will not be among those who are counted righteous. And again, that word right there, is so important. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, it even shows you in the word. It is to be right. And most specifically, again, our reading of scripture tells us to be righteous is to be counted right in God's eyes or just. 
Now, when a person comes into a right relationship with God, it's not because they themselves are right, but because they are like Abraham, remember? Back in the book of Genesis, they believe and God counts that to them as righteousness. So a person who's a sinner and therefore not in a right relationship with God and morally isn't right, is brought into a right relationship with God and counted to be morally right, not by his works, but because he has trusted in the Lord. And specifically because the Old Testament is anticipating Christ, that comes about through the work of Christ. And therefore, the wicked will not stand in the gathering, the assembly of the righteous. And we could understand that to be heaven. That is, where we will dwell with the Lord forever. Verse 6 draws our psalm to a close. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. For, or this is a result of, or in light of what's just been said, for the Lord, again, capital letters, Yahweh here, Israel's covenant God, watches over. I was discussing this passage with our, our summer interns yesterday, and they made a really good point that in some translations it says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And that word knows is really important in scriptures because knowing conveys intimate familiarity with someone. Not just like I'm um, acquainted with that idea or I understand that idea, but it's the idea of a person knowing a person. It's even used in the scriptures to speak of the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. They know each other in that way. So when it says the Lord watches over or knows the way of the righteous, it means that the Lord is intimately familiar with his people and the way they take. It speaks almost of blessing. The Lord is affirming that the way they're walking is right. He knows them because they're walking in the way, the way of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. He's blessing their way. He's intimately familiar with the way. But the way of the wicked, the way of the wicked, leads to ruin. Man, what a stark contrast there. The Lord is watching over to bless the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. God isn't watching over, isn't knowing the way of the wicked, and its ultimate destination is ruin. Which, you know, when we talk about like an ancient city that was once glorious and now uh, is a tourist trap for people to go by. We're looking at the ruins of that city. What was once beautiful, what once was attractive, what once was prosperous is now lying in this dilapidated state. That's sort of the picture we want to see in our minds when we talk about the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Because that's an idea that's often conveyed in the text of Scripture. It seems like the wicked are prospering. And indeed, from a worldly standpoint, they often are. Often wealthy, healthy, uh, thinking they have everything they need, prospering in their businesses, prospering in their home. But because they are neglecting the Lord and not delighting in his word, however prosperous they may seem now, one day, all that will be left are ruins. We're meant to sit in that. Notice how the author ends with that idea. He wants his reader to sit and contemplate what he's just said, to feel the weight of it. Those who are happy, who avoid the way of the wicked, who delight in the law of the Lord, meditate on it day and night, 
They're flourishing, bearing fruit. Their leaves don't wither. Whatever they do prospers. God knows their way. He's keeping it. He's blessing it. And it will result in greater prosperity than you could ever know in this life. Whereas the way of the wicked, as much fun as they seem to be having, as much as they seem to be prospering, in the end, their way, which God doesn't know, Yahweh doesn't bless and keep, leads to ruin. These are important observations for us. And indeed, we've talked a little bit about the meaning as well along the way. And in considering the meaning, we're asking, are there specific instructions, commands given to the reader? Does the passage mention any consequences for not following God's commands? Well, yeah, we've just talked about that. How does the author motivate the reader or audience or make his appeal? He uses this imagery of a tree, prosperous. Or on the other hand, he talks about chaff being blown away. What does the passage teach us about God and his people and life in this world? We've discussed this in detail. That God wants his people to be eternally happy in him. And that happens through delighting in his word, avoiding the way of the wicked. And it will result um, in God keeping their way and blessing their way. Does this passage point forward to Jesus? Is the gospel anticipated or foreshadowed in some way? Well, in that sense, we would have to say uh, there are a couple clues here. Um, when we go back and we read through this, we can think of, of things like delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on it day and night, how Jesus was often in the temple, having conversations with the teachers about the law of the Lord, uh, and how he came to fulfill the law's demands. We see that uh, Jesus um, was willing to follow the way of the righteous, even when it seemed as if the wicked were prospering. We see, ultimately, that Jesus suffers the judgment for us. It anticipates, therefore, the wicked will not stand up within judgment. Well, absolutely they won't. But Jesus suffered the wrath of God in the place of sinners. He took the judgment we deserved. And because of him, we will come to stand in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. And in that sense, we have to ask ourselves the question in application, um, what are we going to do with this text? We've talked about the context. We've talked about, we, we've made lots of observations. We've talked about the meaning that ultimately the author is trying to help us to understand two paths in life, the happy or the wise person and the wicked person. And what they result in in this life, what they look like, what they're imaged as, and what they result in. And so you, the reader, are left there at the end having to make a decision. Will I take the path of the righteous or will I take the path of the wicked? Well, that's a question that only you can answer. But that is indeed the meaning of the text. And ultimately, it points us to Jesus. Because Jesus is the wisdom of God personified. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the path of wisdom runs through the person of Jesus Christ. The only way that you come to enjoy the presence of God the only way that you come to know the assembly of the righteous is because you have come to trust in Jesus, that he fulfilled the law's demands, that he suffered the judgment in your place so that you could enjoy eternal life with him. And you're left with the choice of what will I do ultimately with Jesus. So in the end, let's summarize the big idea and we'll close out our time together. Psalm 1 serves as a gateway into the rest of the book. The reader is forced to ask herself, am I righteous or wicked? The answer is found in what a person does with God's word, the priority we place on it. Is it preeminent? Is it prominent in our lives? 
God's word dwells deeply in the one who knows the Lord, while the wicked flow down the stream of worldly wisdom with the rest of society. Your true identity, who you really are, will be seen in the kind of fruit or the lack thereof that grows out of your life. As Jesus makes clear, it's only when the branch, John 15, abides in the vine that it produces fruit. Or Paul talks about in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is. So if the Word of God is to be your delight and you are to bear fruit, then you must first come to delight in the Word, like John 1 says, himself, who is Jesus Christ. And so the question I would leave you with this week is, have you come to trust in Jesus? Is your life bearing fruit because you've been brought into the vine? Is your life prospering in godly fruit? Is it enduring through difficult seasons because you have planted yourself beside the flowing stream of God's word? Or are you like the useless chaff that the wind blows away? Only you can answer that question. And I hope that your answer runs through Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Psalm 1. Thank you for our time and considering it together. I pray, Lord God, that you would help everyone who's watching this ultimately to turn from the way of the wicked and to run in the way of the righteous and to do so through the person of Jesus Christ and that they would come to stand up in the judgment, not because of their own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We love you, and we thank you so much for this time together, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me for Help Me Study the Bible this week. Again, we'll be back together. We'll be looking at another aspect of wisdom literature next week, and you'll find the notes online so that you can get a head start. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you, and we'll see you back next Wednesday. Thank you.